And we're live. Anybody that feels like staying up late enough to watch us, uh, I have Christy here, and she's going to do a little bit of an interview with me in her in Atheist Asks format. Hi, Christy. Hey, Ivy. It's really nice to see you and to have this chat. I, I'm, I like the channel, but it's nice to have a little girl time. Yes. too. <laughs> so yes, I was really excited when you invited me on the channel. So yeah, I had um, uh, questions and I do a format on my channel called An Atheist Ask and it's really directed at YouTubers who do stuff on atheism but now also, you know, feminism. And the show covers the, the people behind the scenes, you know, what was your story in terms of atheism how did you come to atheism or were you born an atheist and then in the case of feminists how did you come to your feminism and then also why did you make a youtube channel and it's so it's a really easy format and mm -hmm. uh yeah i just thought it would be nice to ask you those questions so we can just yeah. go in order with atheism then feminism then youtube Sounds so great. whatever you're willing to tell us about yeah your background and how you came to be an atheist and then um we can maybe However, it lines up with your activism. We can always go back and tie that into the feminism too. So, you know, tell us, tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, my story. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I've never really been religious in any sense. Um, when I was really little, um, my mom raised me with Christian, a Christian sort of value system, but. She rarely ever made me go to church, so I never really considered myself a Christian. Um, and then once I got into high school, I started exploring more um, pagan and pagan type religions. And I sort of ended up becoming an eclectic pagan. And then after high school, when I went into college, I it never really made it, it stopped making sense, I suppose. That's, I don't really know how else to say it. it. Just, there was this point where it just sort of felt a little more ridiculous to be doing it. So that um, was in your teens? Yes, yes. And, and, uh, cause that's, I think, you know, that's a, a, a time of that awakening kind of comes up. And it, at that point, just to interrupt you, sorry, was it really directed more at monotheism or religions in general when you started to feel slight skepticism toward these claims? Um, just the, the whole concept of an actual deity of really any kind, it, learning more about them, it sort of started to feel like they were aspects of emotions and ideas kind of just personified as opposed to like actual entities. And did that create any kind of crisis of morality for you at the time or make you feel really unsettled about your place yeah. in the universe? <laughs> yeah, it, it did a bit. Um, you know, having that secure, the, having those ideas like kind of fall away and then, then they not believe in them anymore, but still, you know, wanting to not, still wanting to feel like my time wasn't wasted, you know, mm -hmm. and all that stuff that I was doing, trying to bridge that gap. Um, I think that's where it was mostly for me, where I was having the issues so yeah. I just I still have all my stuff from back then and some of the things I still like like I'm still really into rocks and crystals just because I really like them and I still burn incense because I like the way that it smells and it makes me feel better it's uplifting you know and it's just a mood thing um, but it, I don't use it in a worship sense or a religious way and that's just not the way I am anymore so. yeah so then, so we can continue with the story. You mm -hmm. started to have these thoughts and wondering, and and how did the wondering, yeah, proceed from there to actually end up in, in atheism? Um, the relationship I was in at the time, um, I was in a really long twelve-year relationship, and we were eventually got married. But he was an atheist, so he was really my first exposure to it, and so he would play a lot of Dawkins and that whole crowd and it just just made sense after a point you know just hearing it enough times it's like yeah okay yeah yeah okay yeah so it's, it's pretty much what happened I suppose. and within your social circle your family circle was there any penalty or did you come out as an atheist quite easily or was it something that you kept hidden from your friends and family for a while uh, I'm pretty much 
open about it. I'm just not like in your face. I have friends that are Christian still and like in family settings we would still like if the family was doing a family meal and there was a prayer over the meal, you know, I would just be quiet. I wouldn't pray along with them because it wasn't I didn't believe in it, so why do it, you know? Felt very disingenuous to be doing it, so I didn't do it. Um, but I was still respectful towards my family's beliefs because they're my family and I didn't want to alienate myself from them. And in turn, they didn't alienate me because I didn't believe the same thing they did. So. Has talking about your atheism ever made a situation, like have you ever been approached where somebody is a little bit taken aback by your saying that you're an atheist? Um, most of the time when I tell people, they kind of just go, okay, and that's usually where it ends. Like, they don't, it's very rare that I get asked more about it just because of the way that I am around people. I'm very silent and don't really talk very much. This is probably the most that I've talked in a, in a while. This is why I was so excited about the opportunity to chat with you. <laughs> Because yeah. one thing I've noticed in the comments is that people will say, Ivy made a good point. Ivy, you know, so like the, when you do talk, it's worth listening. Yeah. Uh, I think people know that about you. Yeah, I, I do try not to speak unless I know what I'm saying. I don't just like the. the... <laughs> so your, your coming to atheism was actually, um, I mean, it had a, a little bit of an, an awkward transition there in your teens when you kind of had to learn to let that go, but eventually it, it wasn't a, a, a real painful some people it's with their families and their social lives and they're because they have a lot of friends and church associations and they have mm -hmm. to feel like they're lying to them but because your your were your family was nominally or maybe culturally religious it sounds like more than practicing so that transition away from religion wasn't quite as emotionally profound because you didn't have a lot of emotions invested in it other than that kind of security thing that you were talking about yeah um in the community that i live in there is, <laughs> um, um, it is a heavily heavy church community. So whenever I would be in a social situation where I would need to interact in a church, I just wouldn't say anything and let people just think what they wanted. Um, <clears throat> particularly when it was work involved for one reason or another. I'm sure somebody's going to be listening to this that knows me, and they're going to be like, ha-ha, but, you know, I really don't care at this point. Yes. Um, sorry, there was another point that I was going to make. So, yes, my family was more is more spiritual than religious, so, yeah, there wasn't so much of the dogma to have to deal with. <clears throat> and when you became, when you sort of came out as an atheist, how did you deal with that, um, one of the important things about it, I think, that when you walk away from the notion of gods or the universe being a just place or there being, you know, some sort of afterlife is you have to own your own morality. Yeah. You have to decide what what you believe and what is right and wrong and why. And I was wondering how that process or what that was like for you. Um, was it really easy for you to just figure out what your moral compass was? Where did you draw on um, what did you draw on in order to build a morality that was based in, you know, in you and in this life rather than in a book from the Bronze Age? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it, I am a very genuine person to people, so I want them to be genuine back to me. And so I do a lot of, I guess, self-reflection towards people. So if somebody upsets me, I react the way that I would want to be reacted to. In a way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's, I guess that's how I figured it out. You really just came from a place of empathy. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah. You know, when I started out teaching as a graduate teaching assistant, they don't do much in the way of training at, <laughs> like, they kind of expect that if you've made it all the way up to doing your PhD that you've seen enough people teach that suddenly, suddenly you now should be able to just walk into a seminar and do it based on like monkey see monkey do. <laughs> and one of uh, the person who was leading the discussion on the day of training was asked the question, what do you do if you have a student who is a problem or if you're not sure how to handle a situation? And the, the person who's actually my PhD supervisor, he said, if you just, just just treat the other person with respect, you're probably not going to go wrong. 
whatever the situation is, you know, and because there were questions about what if a student claims that they have uh, like a dyslexia and in the, the process for they don't tell you until the essays are due or whatever else, you know, and you just said, yeah, whatever your issues is, issues are with a student, if they're, you know, like a little bit, you don't know what to do, just treat the other person with respect. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's so easy. <laughs> you don't need to write a whole book about that. Just well, it's easy in theory, but then if somebody's really upsetting you, keeping yourself in check can be hard. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because I actually had to break up a fight in one of my classrooms between two women, and one of the women who was in the altercation uh, as a student, uh, I didn't. Yeah, I had a really hard time. It was. It took everything to do that whole treat her with respect because it was just like, oh, I can totally get why someone would want to smash you in the face. I don't. I don't approve. That should not. You know, don't be having a computer. Don't be having a fight in the computer labs. <laughs> this is a university, not a playground. But I totally get why she would just like get in your face. So. Yes, um, even when the little uh, devil on your shoulder says, ah, yes, in those kinds of settings, you're a better person than I am because in my comment section, I go, uh, I tilt. If somebody comes in quite aggressive to me, I can very easily tilt bitch word uh, right back at them and push it back. <laughs> and, and you're much nicer than me. Um, so good on you. You're a role model for me. Yeah, the, the whole angry redhead stereotype really doesn't apply to me. Nope, not a firecracker. Nope. <laughs> so then, so we've kind of got the atheism bit, and I have a feeling that feminism also started to come up in your life, obviously, before you got on the channel. So can we catch up with your feminism and then maybe together tie those together, um, you know, unite those two ideas and get into your, your YouTube activism? So on the feminism side, were you always, were you raised as a feminist, or was it something that kind of you figured out as you got older? Well, it's, I wasn't raised as a feminist. I was raised in a very um, uh, female empowering environment. My grandmother worked her whole entire life uh, as a secretary and she always had a job and she was always bringing income in while she was also raising my mom and my uncle. And then my mom ended up raising my sister and I on her own as a single parent for the most part. And she took herself back to school to get into a career that actually brought in money, you know, so she could do that. Um, so I had definitely had the two of them as really strong female role models in my life. And I was, I don't know, I guess I'm, the whole subservient thing never really fit in my life. That, the whole concept of a woman being subservient to a man just never clicked with me. So that's was sort of in that vein, I suppose. Um, yeah. And then um, I never really considered myself a feminist until I started looking around on YouTube and seeing some of the stuff. I think Lacey Green was one of the earlier ones that I saw that were like in your face sort of. This, these are why I'm a feminist and there's a bunch of stuff in there. I'm like, that's pretty out there, but I can see that. And just then as I kept looking around on YouTube more and more, it was like, well, that's not what feminism is to me. Why are all these people like bashing on feminism? You know, because in my mind, it's a good thing. And there is still, there are still instances where it's useful and, like not just useful but like the mentality can still help people you know there are women in my local area that are in very bad relationships and need a support system and the women that are doing that are feminists yeah i think that all of this is is really uh interesting and also i, I think important to articulate that um so much of of so much can be communicated through role models or through modeling social behaviors. So, you know, my mom too, uh, my parents got split up when I was, before I was 10, I think. And so she was a single parent. 
and raised us and you know had a job and had financial independence and you know we didn't really do going to mcdonald's was like a really big deal for us you know but we had a roof over our heads we had clothes on our back we had big open fields in the back of our house to play in dirt and sticks and trees and our imagination so you know as kids we were fine but it didn't even occur to me that she was doing this you know thing about this amazing incredibly hard work which parents do and single parents have to do even more mm -hmm. which is to raise kids on their own and she wouldn't have been able to do that if she wasn't able to have a job and allowed to drive and to be able to have her own bank account and to be able to get credit in her own name and all mm -hmm. of these things happened um well not the driving bit of it but getting having financial independence was something that happened in her lifetime because she was alive during the course of second wave feminism you know my <clears throat> my grandmother never had a bank account i think in her own name because it was my grandfather's and she never learned to drive so she was entirely dependent on him and they lived out in the middle of the country or someone else to get the groceries so for me you know grandma was trapped at home you know and mm -hmm. whereas my mom was out so i had a bit of a more of a comparison there and yeah understanding that women's empowerment a lot of times comes from freeing them up to do things and then also that their work is paid equally to men so they're not being shafted and those families aren't being shafted you know there's a lot of issues that that go around with women's liberation and i do compare the what i call the non-activist men's so-called rights movement to the women's movement because the women's movement is focused on general liberation there's still economic issues to be addressed there are social issues to be addressed there are political issues there are religious issues to be addressed and also one of the things that i want to talk about eventually in my channel is this whole idea of the sexual sphere because with our biology men and women if you want to talk about heteronormativity and i'm sorry i'm going to kind of but but it, for heterosexual couples or for heterosexual people then sex actually does become a serious place of contestation not because we choose it or women are bad or men are bad but because our biology in some ways kind of already sets us up for a slightly antagonistic relationship with the opposite sex in terms of what people you know what want to get out of it and we don't really i think unpack that and talk about how those sexual dynamics feed into politics feed into economics feed into emotional relationships and so it's it's it covers both the pro public and the private sphere because women's reproduction and their cycles is bound up with their sexual sexuality their sexual sphere and that has knock-on effects for their employment so yeah it is a really complicated series of of um issues that can be put together but women's liberation um, is different from advocating for remedying the instances where men are legally disadvantaged. So I see a really big difference between the two movements because what women need um, is much has been much wider uh, across all of these spheres. And your role models showed you something that really didn't exist until second wave feminism, which is two generations of women out there earning, being strong women and, and not looking back. Whereas other women had to learn how to do that or even know that that was a possibility. So yeah, I just um, was kind of, I went off on a little bit of a <laughs> there, but I hope it was slightly interesting. So um, yeah, getting back to you. So you had this um, experience growing up, you went on YouTube, there wasn't a lot of good content, but how do you move from going, yeah, there's crap content on YouTube to unifying your, your atheism with feminism to kind of bring it those two elements of of social movements together well um the the word patriarchy really because in my mind patriarchy and religion are really tied together and one of the core things in feminism is to fight against patriarchy so that that is where it first tied into it. that was the first real thing that was like okay the two really are complementary to each other in this sense and can actually work together um to bring you can bring logic the logic side of the atheism into feminism to try and help steer it into the right direction that, that's i guess you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Can you maybe unpack that that intellectual <clears throat> journey a little bit more about how those pieces, in from what you remember, came together? Like, the um, you know the religious patriarchy side and atheism. How did those? Was it a was it a book? Was it 
thinking about, was it hearing a video or um, just thinking about it on your own? How did you kind of see those parallels and, and bring them together and, uh, in, in, in your own mind? Well, <clears throat> um, the Skeptic Feminist started out on Facebook and that was where I was first exposed to it. And Russian Deck Pool had posted a few things on there and that was actually the first place that I saw it. And <clears throat> so I guess that's what I can say. Yeah. And, and I really felt that what he was doing should have some more push to it. And so I felt like I sh what I have experienced firsthand can really add to what he was doing already. So we ended up moving it to YouTube. Yeah. And do you feel like there is uh, enough of an understanding of the interconnectedness between religious patriarchy and atheist critique? Sorry, it's really late. Yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's really early. It's, oh, it's morning for me. So, I mean, I, I think one of the well, maybe I'll, I'll, I, that was a great question. Rephrase that, yes, <laughs> I think that it's a that atheists miss out um, on a really powerful set of critiques in the social world when they poo poo patriarchism, uh, patriarchy, because patriarchy is linked back to homophobia and the oppression of, of LGBT people, it's, it's linked back to ignoring male victims of sexual abuse. And it is the basis for a lot of really messed up attitudes toward women and toward sex and toward marriage and toward power. And so for me, um, it's astounding to me that people can deny the in influence of patriarchy when you are an atheist. Because when, at least to me, when you read the Bible or any of these holy books, that's what jumps out at me the most. It's its dominance by male characters, it's male values, and it's sort of like it's normative patriarchal values that it keeps reinforcing. And that women are these side projects, or they're these just little actors that are there to prop up the men. So yeah, it was more about, uh, do you find it surprising that more people on YouTube don't make that connection between patriarchal oppression and the atheist movement uh, in in modern times in the West. Um, a, a bit, I, I think. Um, I don't really know how to phrase what's in my mind, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why I don't talk very much is because I don't know how to speak off the cuff as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Oh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um, you want to pr pretty much like. It's, it's really complicated, like there's a lot of factors that tie into it, but I, it is hard to understand why more atheists aren't seeing the connection. Um, I don't know if they're not seeing it or if not, they're not thinking that it's a key to it or what, so I don't really know. Yeah, because um, it seems to me like they observe, they, a lot of people will condemn the homophobia in the Bible. And they'll condemn things like, you know, uh, having multiple wives, or they'll condemn the way that it justifies the oppression of women in very specific ways, you know, like they would point at Islam and his patriarchy. But even though they see the symptoms, they don't see the underlying cancer that permeates the text. And I guess that's, that's for me what I think your channel does a really good job at and what I try to occasionally make videos about, yeah. which is to make things that you don't see because you're so used to them being in the culture they're invisible to pull it out and turn it around in some way to go this is fucked up oh that, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah that yeah yeah you know <laughs> yeah that is i hadn't thought about it that way but that's seriously fucked up so um that's what i think you know it's it's good about your channel and, and on my channel and, and i think other people who try to take up this critique is that all, it's not like we're making things up. It's all in the text. You're just so used to seeing women being prostitutes and whores and concubines that you haven't really stopped to think about what that says about a god who would compare a city. In order to insult it, he would compare something to a menstruating woman or a whore as the worst thing it could be. What does that say about the mentality of that god if you think that's a supernatural being? It basically means he, he has contempt for half of his human creation. Yeah. That's fucked up, you know, well, or there's an incident, sorry, I'll, one more thing, there's an incident in the, with Miriam and Moses and Aaron, I think, in Exodus, where Miriam and Aaron are 
like thrown shade at Moses and God reprimands them. And even though he, they were both guilty, he only really picks on Miriam and said, you know, if it was her father, wouldn't he have spit in her face? Apparently, fathers spitting in their daughter's face was a common custom of that time in order to communicate that cultural value in that phrase. And I was just like, again, those are things that you don't hear about in Sunday school. And they're also really things you don't hear about on YouTube. So, well, and, you know, you can argue that most Christians cherry pick the Bible, so they take the good points there and they leave out those things. But my whole stance on that is it's then revise the book and don't use the same book don't use the same text if most of it you're not going to be paying attention to it's yeah, good to have a good moral compass but you know if you're preaching out of this book where most of it is ridiculous and doesn't apply anymore what the hell yeah, it's time to take a black marker and start going through. And, well, and, not, not even that. I mean, just make like, a new book. To. I mean, no, I yeah, don't... <laughs> it, it, when it gets update. to that point, then you need something else or just stop claiming that you're part of this group. I mean, I know that's one of the criticisms we get with feminism is that why do you guys still call yourself a feminist if, you know, what you're saying is more of an egalitarian and, and more a humanist point of view, you know? And, the answer to that is, well, we're approaching this from the feminist perspective, you know, we're approaching this to make these changes in this sense, you know, this overall, we want equality for everyone, but we're pushing it through the feminist vein right now, you know, it's where we feel that it needs the most attention right now with the things that we need to talk about. That's a really good point, because from an academic point of view, if you wanted to evaluate something from uh, the person, like the, to evaluate in particular the sex differences or the sex norms or anything to do with how it is gendered in society, you draw on feminist theory. You draw on feminist critique. Why? Because it was feminist thinkers who did all the work about egalitarianism and equality and what a just society would look like and where the deficiencies are. So if you take a feminist critical approach, that means that you're looking at social phenomenon in a way in order to see the gendered dimensions of it. So then, of course, yeah, you're bringing your feminism to it because your feminism is informing your evaluation of power relations and social structures and norms and everything else. So, yeah, this idea that somehow, um, you know, you can replace feminism with egalitarianism. One of the objections I have to that is say, OK, I'm an egalitarian. How does that then help me understand race relations? How does that help me understand the, um, you know, sort of like a minority population problems faced in the community? You can't, if you just say, I'm for diversity, what you're not doing is any of the work that actually illuminates that diversity. Yeah. Uh, How so, do you get there? Yeah. You know? And that's adding to the reason why I'm, we're doing our channel on YouTube is because it can reach so many people and like I said, when I was looking into feminism stuff, it was all complete, you know, bullshit. It was just people bashing on feminism, using it as clickbait, or, you know, giving misinformation, propaganda from one extreme or another, and there were no centrist, sane voices. So, you know, being the skeptic feminist, it's not an oxymoron. It's like, actually, yes, you approaching feminism from a skeptical point of view, you know? Well said. And since you've done now what turned out to be a beautiful segue between <laughs> sections, let's talk about, yeah, that moment of when, what is it like, uh, what, what was the, the thing that flipped it over to kind of go, okay, yep, let's do the channel, that we need to do the channel, two, uh, did you have any idea what you were getting into, and then three, what is your experience been so let's start i'll remember those okay um, so, so starting the, first from the, the first one was yeah what what was the the thing the lead up to actually going you know what yeah let's do the work let's start the channel let's let's get going T tell us tell us that story um well russian deadpool had a history in doing video stuff already he had, had some other youtube channels and did some other fun not so serious stuff so he's done most of the video editing um, so far and 
he got it set up initially and he was like hey we should do this together and I'm like yeah let's do it together so and i was like well where do we start and because i had absolutely no idea i'm like i just know that i want to say some things and so we started collaborating on some scripts and um finding information and bouncing ideas back and forth and then started moderating some comments and it there were some fun points where it was laughs and stuff and some other things where it's really serious and the whole oh i can't i'm terrible <laughs> i can't even remember why we just start to this the villain thing just oh yeah because it's probably just because it's fun <laughs> and i have red hair so i like <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's a nice thing for your channel because it kind of it, it does give it, you know, like its own little flavor. And when people come, it's there's a whole world to it. And I we the video where we are burning the few books that was really one of the first serious ones that we had done. Where all three of us did it together, we spent a lot of time figuring out what we do with that and then doing it. So it's a collaboration and, um, you know, you guys take different parts and different roles and, and bring it together. But it looks like you have a pretty uh, solid structure in terms of what content, how often you put out content. And so it looks like you have agreed goals, but then how does yes. it work on the, in the, with behind the scenes? Behind the scenes, it's, uh, it's pretty much whoever can get to the comments first. And okay. they're sort of like a a range if there's something there that we're like well i don't know what to do about this one then someone else will chime in and we'll put it out there this this person's really being a dick let's get rid of them or occasionally someone will get drunk and go through it and ban everyone <laughs> just you know it's so we, we have to keep it entertaining for us otherwise we're going to lose interest in a sense like it's important but it's also a hobby because I work two jobs. Fresh and Deadpool works a job. Harley works a job. You know, so we would like to devote more time to it. But at the moment, we do what we can and we uh, distribute things as as much as we can based on who has the most time to do it. So. Yeah, I think you guys do a great job of getting content out on a regular basis. So you know, Thank you. I tip my cap to you on that. <laughs> Certainly, and quality stuff. I mean, you you know, there's um, a lot of even it, with the, when you have your live things, those are great. But the mm -hmm. mirroring too is is really important because uh, we were talking about off air that I've found other really great feminist channels watching from you guys. So yeah, there's um, there's. A, a, do you find it difficult or to find good content to mirror or do you have a whole list of like three months worth of stuff that you've got queued up because there's so much on YouTube? Uh, it it kind of comes and goes in waves like sometimes we'll have a lot to post and others we won't and we're um, there tries to be a bit of a, <clears throat> a variety uh, in the the feminism and atheism and then some other fun stuff just so that people aren't like oh my god why do they always post this one thing right mm -hmm. and are there any uh, like guidelines for the content you'll put up any other topics that you have decided not to post uh i don't really think there's anything off limits it's just if one of us finds something interesting we bring it up with the others and we are like hey what do you think and usually it's like yeah that's pretty good. Let's either mirror it or do a response to it. So I think doing YouTube is unlike any other hobby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you find that, but I was yeah, interested was, you know, what your expectations were. Have they been met? Have they been exceeded? Have, have you been surprised? What has it been like to be uh, running a, ch a feminist, uh, atheist YouTube channel? Um, well, I guess the most surprising thing is just the some of the hate stuff that we've received. Like I wasn't expecting as much as it was like even though I initially saw all the terrible information out there, I didn't really think that people would like seek it out based on certain words. Like if we put some something with um the MRA in it, if we put like MRA something, then it ends up getting a lot of attention from them and it ends up getting more negative attention than um, some of the other stuff that we've done. And 
some of that was because we had some misinformation when we started out, you know, because there was so much propaganda on one side and the other, and we didn't really know what the MRA was, the way that they see themselves and the, what they try to do, whether they're succeeding or not, is, you know, it depends on who you're talking to. Yeah, and actually that's a good point. I, I would like to learn more about what your understanding of and your interactions with MRAs and the MRM has been over the course of your channel and what is your goal when it comes to interacting with MRAs and the MRM? Um, well, they have certain points with some things and we have no reason to fight against them. And if there are instances where we agree with some of the shit that men get shafted on, then we'll mirror it or say something about it too, you know. But that's not our main focus. Do you feel that um, that MRA, uh, in your experience dealing with people who, even if they say they're not men's rights activists, they tend to take up an anti-feminist um, discourse that is also something that would be found in the MRM is um, do you feel like they're, they are, have you found people on that side willing to concede acknowledge valid points when it comes to women's oppression in the West because obviously they do a lot with acknowledging women's oppression outside of their culture mm -hmm. but you know you guys will say yeah if men are getting shafted we'll acknowledge that and that sh that's fucked up we shouldn't do that do you find that willingness on the other side as well when you point things out to them factually that this that women are deprived or disadvantaged? It depends on who we're talking to, in all honesty. Like some people won't budge on it and others will be like will say it's not a, a rights thing, it's a privilege thing or other things. So it's I don't want to say, I don't like talking bad about people um, because they're just trying to do what they feel is right most of the time, but when they're clearly not and they're just spreading misinformation, that's where I had a problem. And do you feel like people, you've opened up some, yeah, do you feel like you've opened up some channels of communication as a consequence? Um, I would help, I would like to think so because it's one of my personal goals with it is that people don't yell at each other <laughs> and they actually have discussions and can talk about what is on either side. Do you want to uh, talk, since we're on the topic in terms of like, you know, getting out new content and challenging people's preconceptions, you made uh, an appearance on Sargon of Akkad's ch channel and mm -hmm. you, as a consequence, got a lot of views and people coming over. So do you want to talk a little bit about the reaction to your appearance? Yeah. Um, for the most part, it was pretty positive, you know, like the amount of, we got, I think around 500 new subscribers from that chat and majority of them came over and said that they were happy that we talked to him and wow, a feminist that actually makes sense or doesn't completely sound like an idiot or, you know, uh, is bridging the gap between, with this two sides or whatever, there, there were several things that on our, yeah, we left those comments. Um, so those were most of what we got. Um, I did see Sargon's. Um, I have been paying attention to what's on his. I've applied to most of it, but I have seen a lot of it. And more negative stuff was on his. But with how many people he has that sees that stuff, it's, it's, the scale is appropriate, I would say. 500 subs, that's an amazing jump. Yeah. Yeah, we, we were very pleased about that. It was really nice to talk to Sargon. And it wasn't what we were expecting at all. We were expecting him to go on there and it not to be as pleasant of a conversation as it was. I know I didn't really talk much, but uh, yeah. Well, I mean, he didn't really have any points to make because, as we pointed out off air, he didn't know a lot of the facts that you presented to him on why feminism is needed in the West. So I guess. Uh, you know, one would think that maybe he would have come in with a, a very firm position with facts behind him, making some kind of empirical case. Uh, but really, he just kind of went, tell me why feminism is needed in the West. And you went A, B, and C. He went, oh, didn't know that. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I don't think he was expecting us to be the way that we were. And that's 
what we hear the most from that, the people on that side. Either they absolutely think that we're ridiculous because of the fun aspects, aspects of our channel, or they say, wow, you guys are interesting. I didn't think of it that way. That's new information. I didn't know that. And has, I mean, obviously with 500 new subs, you've seen a lot of activity in your back catalog, but have you seen any knock-on comments of people reacting to other things on your channel in a positive way once they were exposed to the information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we, we had more views on some of the other, other videos that we posted and good comments on them. Excellent. So yeah, I mean, I think um, in some ways, if you know, I don't know what Sargon's intention was, but if you know, the idea was to put you guys up there um, in order to be able to do a stereotype straw manning, uh, that doesn't work with real people. <laughs> so, real people that dress up as supervillains. <laughs> yes. But at least have done their homework and know what they're talking about and come prepared to discuss the facts and evidence, which you guys were. And you did it, you know, in a very pleasant, non-confrontational way. Um, yeah, and so that's, uh, you were good ambassadors to Thank counter you. the narrative that is being constructed about what feminists think and say and do in the absence of actual evidence. Yeah, so going forward, what's, what are your goals with, with the skeptic feminist? Now that you've got this 500 sub bump, <laughs> um, it's right. Yeah, just keep going the way that it is. I mean, there's a lot more information coming out about what's happening with the Islam stuff. So uh, we're probably going to be addressing a bit more of that. Um, just sharing more information that we find. Just keep looking for new points of views, new ideas, so that we can share and the probably are going to be lulls here and there, but mm -hmm. yeah, just keep on doing what we're doing. And if we get anything wrong, we'll correct ourselves and retract a statement or you know, whatever. Do you, do, you do. Yeah. do you feel uh, a, a hypersensitivity when you create content about uh, criticizing Islam? I don't. <laughs> um, I, it makes me sick, some of the things that I've seen. That it really actually, I have just been sick over some of the things that I have seen, and I don't know why I didn't notice it before. I don't know if it was just because it didn't impact me as much because I wasn't involved in the, you know, feminism, or if we just have more information now or what, but it's just sickening. And do you guys ever have any problems with that uh, in terms of uh, feet blowback on your content or people, you know, harassing you as a consequence of your critique? Not yet. Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, that, again, part of the narrative is that feminists are not willing to criticize uh, Islam, which I don't know what, I mean, I have, and I am perfectly willing to, and I know you guys do. I think that there's, you know, again, a, a tendency to do Tumblr feminism or, you know, like take these little pieces of confirmation bias rather than looking out there because, yeah, as you said, you know, it's, um, there are basic human rights things. I was talking to Kevin last night about he's going to be starting a petition to try to get the UK government to cut off its interactions with Saudi Arabia. And obviously there's a lot of countries that you could pick, but Saudi Arabia, because it's so rich and because it's so incredibly repressive, um, is a good place to start. And yeah, I think that I personally, I, I guess I feel a little bit more hesitancy in a lot of ways, speaking about uh, criticizing Islam than I do criticizing the men's rights activists. Um, because even if a, a stalker, uh, you know, kind of like, I, I live on my own, but I live in a very secure building. So I like, I think anyone who wanted to harass me would have to buy an airline ticket. It would be like quite a bit of effort. But I feel that if, um, because I live in a country where there is, um, you know, a lot of issues and uh, in Europe you know we've had problems with terrorism and attacks and we've had things like the, the bloggers in Bangladesh being attacked I do have a concern about being a, a Western liberal woman out there criticizing Islam really intensely because one of the things that Kevin and I didn't get a chance to talk to talk about last night was my massive problems with covering 
religious covering in Islam. And I have real big problems. When I see women covered, it, for me, they might as well be wearing a collar around their neck or handcuffs around their, their wrists in terms of, even if they're choosing to do that, what they're choosing to do is conform themselves to a value that their bodies uh, need to be covered up because um, otherwise men won't be able to control themselves. It's putting the responsibility of controlling men's behavior onto the women and the way that they do that to control, to protect themselves is to make themselves completely asexual or even like with a burqa mm -hmm. and to, 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 to cover up their humanity. So I guess I'm talking about it now. Um, I have massive, massive problems with covering in Islam, but I haven't made a video about it in all honesty because I, I don't know that I've fully articulated my views where I feel comfortable putting an entire video out about it, but I'm more worried about the blowback from that yeah, and where I that live. Is, yeah, and you, like, just with what's happening, you are in have a higher degree of danger than we do where we're at because we are in a very white community. And yeah, if I was living in northern America Wisconsin, and, yeah, I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't care. <laughs> Yeah, so we have no issue talking about it, and like even if someone were to take actual issue and come and find us, you know, it. I personally still feel like it's worth saying something over, worth advocating about. You know, it's it's worth it to say something, even though I can't physically do anything about it. It's worth it to say something. And that is it. When it comes to dealing with Islam, especially as atheists, we don't have any ability to change things. We can be on the outside criticizing and pointing fingers and saying, you should do better. And here is why, as a decent fucking human being, you should do better. But there is no ability for us as women or as atheists to make the necessary changes. All we can do is get the ideas out there. Yeah. And then whereas with, let's say, atheism in the U.S., there is at least an indirect path through petitioning the government or through contributing to a candidate or doing political activism or starting a campaign. So there are methods of redress available to us in the West that aren't available to us when it comes to confronting Islamic sexism and patriarchy. So yeah, and so I think I will eventually do a video about it, but I want to make sure that I have all my ducks in a row and I, and I tie the issue of covering women in a gendered way that men don't have to cover themselves on the same moral modesty basis into a larger discussion of yeah women in islam and that it, it being a symptom of a deeper mental pathology towards women's bodies that we find in a lot of religions but is most obviously manifest in modern times in islam so. yeah. thanks for letting me kind of free form that because it's been in my head for a while but i haven't really put words together in, in order like that. So I appreciate <laughs> you listening to me free associate. Sometimes when I'm freestyle, I lose confidence. <laughs> yeah, so have you been, in, have you, has it been an enjoyable experience generally being a YouTuber? Overall, for the most part, there are some days where it, it's a little frustrating because my workload is so heavy uh, and I don't have time. So I don't, you know, I'm trying to get that balance so that I'm contributing as much as I can while still not putting my life into ruin because it's, you know, I'm not getting paid to be on YouTube. So. And which we are not going to monetize our videos because we don't want to have that there. We, we want, we don't want to do that. Yeah. Well, um, there is a Patreon account though, um, which mm -hmm. I've, Actually, I, I don't have much to give, but I, I doubled my contribution from one to two dollars a month after you asked. We appreciate any dollar that anybody <laughs> wants to give to us yeah. because it does go towards the, the videos that we put out in one way or another. Yeah, and I think, you know, for people who just click on videos, it's, and if you stop to think about it, probably people would, it would make sense, but, you know, you do need a camera, you, you or you, you need to find the software if you want to do everything for free on a shoestring budget. In some ways, that takes up more time and effort to find it and find something free and learn it and then deal with it because it probably has fewer features than the paid version, so you're limited mm -hmm. and that constrains you. Um, so, yeah, for me, I mean, I, I like sunk a grand into startup costs for my YouTube channel, so I have no problem monetizing. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm still like 600 in the hole. Um, yeah. 
but you know when I uh, I do get it I, I put it into new equipment or I just like I got a new version of the director stuff and yeah I think the monetizing thing is um, it, it's a personal decision and I think you know Patreon is a good way for you guys to go because if you don't want to do the ads then you're getting the money directly from the people who really support your channel and yeah. that's a that's a nice backup and I like I love my patrons and you know I have a hangout for them um, but yeah the whole monetizing I feel a little bit like I had that thing with Kevin last night and then I have to go and put well it's it's an hour and 10 minutes long like that's a that was a lot of content to produce and like okay yeah. well how many commercial breaks every 17 minutes that's still better than a television show so and they can skip the ads I make them skippable so yeah I'll just throw in like three over an hour and ten minutes and try to balance it that way but um, yeah the whole time when when you're donating your time and there's no financial reward then it does make it harder to put out the content you want to because first thing you need to do is pay the bills yeah so I understand that and it's you know and feeling torn between the content that you want to put out and the time that it takes to make it and having work and having a social life yeah balance yeah but you guys are doing a good job oh, your, you. your channel has been you know, just steady steady growth and yeah. do you have any uh, long-term like goals for 5,000 are you just making this up as you go we're we're just going with it as it as it happens, you know. Um, so we're definitely going to be making more mistakes as time goes on. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, that's that's part of life, you know. Make yeah, definitely. And if you were wrong on something, you correct it. And move on. Do you have any previews of what um, ideas might be coming up in the future? Any um, any? Okay, yep, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> That's why you go back and get people to come back to the channel. Keep checking. Come I'll be back making more faces and videos. So you'll be making what? More faces and reacting. And no, <laughs> um, Harley and I are going to be doing more more videos because people have been wanting more of us since they keep hearing Russian Deadpool talking. So yeah, we're we're working on more videos with both of us alone and together and. You know, like I'm doing this with you by myself. So, yeah. yeah, and it's been great. Well, I'm in favor of that. I mean, when you <laughs> when you contacted me, I was like, yes, yes, yes. When can we do it? So I was really excited for the opportunity. And um, yeah, because again, you know, I I think that Russian Deadpool does a good job of making arguments, and he manages to keep his calm in ways that I don't know that I would when confronting some kinds of people. But as I I said, when you speak. I, I see a lot of people commenting on your comments in the comments. Yeah. When you speak, you say something really worth listening to. So it's good that you know you're going to be getting up uh, on more because I think there is a lot of a good more good comments in there that uh, people will really appreciate. Yeah. yeah. So I think we kind of I don't know how we are in time or how long you wanted to go, but I think we've kind of naturally come from your past yeah. and. Uh, right up until the present time. Is there anything in terms of like the nexus of your atheism and feminism and activism that you had thought about before we chatted that we haven't had a chance to to get to? Um, uh, as far as activism goes, uh, you know, there's the activism and advocacy. They they kind of use people use them synonymously. They interchange them. Um, we do more. Um, we're trying to do more advocacy in, in our community and just fitting that in with everything else. We, we are working on that. Um, and we have already been doing some, like with the Russian Deadpool and Harley in particular, do the self defense stuff. That's not, that's not where my strength lies. And I'm working, with, I'm trying to arrange with the women's shelter here in, where we live to donate some of my services because I'm a massage therapist and a graphic designer to so see what I can give to them that way. So, yeah, I actually I trained as a massage therapist as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I know that one of the things that I, I wasn't I, one of the options or one of the things that could happen was to go to abuse shelters mm -hmm. and do work with uh, massage with people who are using those services. And obviously that requires some sensitivity and training because mm -hmm. sometimes touching people in a certain way. So learning um, if there's a point where, let's say, their abuser would grab them around the neck. Yeah, and or on the shoulders them. or yeah. arm somewhere. Yeah. 
Yeah, and working with them to relax their bodies when people are touching them by knowing being sensitive to their previous abuse and not trying to remind them of being grabbed in that way while you're trying to get them to relax. Yeah. And also, I often find with massage, I don't know if you have, but if people have a lot of emotional stuff that they're holding in, that once they let their bodies relax, it lets their guard down too. I've had people on my table crying about unrelated things, just, you know, yeah. Um, and okay. it's really therapeutic because massage is non-safe, non-sexual physical contact. And a lot of adults don't have that, unless you have kids that you get hugs from a lot of times, you know. Yeah. Um, most adult physical contact is sexual, but we need physical contact just to, you know, to calm us, to promote the hormones and the chemicals that allow us to react. So, yeah, your massage work um, in association with your advocacy would actually really touch people, like literally and figuratively, yeah. um, in potentially really profound and meaningful ways. Is another way of massively given. I mean, doing a mm -hmm. massage is, is quite labor and time intensive, but I think that the, the benefit that that would provide, it's a perfect fit for you, I think. And in addition to that, we, all three of us are also involved in the local atheist group that's in our town. And right now, uh, most recently, we had an issue with um, religious documents being handed out in schools, um, kind of almost forcefully in a way. It wasn't like, you must take this, it was more like a bribery, like, there's, there's donuts if you come and get a free Bible sort of thing. So, and and constant vigilance. Yeah. yeah. I, I had no idea how often people were breaking that separation of church and state law until I started doing my channel. Yeah, and I know that they mean well, but it's they're they're definitely as soon as it starts to to go over a little bit, then it's harder to get it back out. So you do have to stay on top of that. Yeah, definitely. Because if you do it for one group, then you have to do it for all groups, and then yeah. sudden, yeah. So it, it, it's just like it's so obvious to me, at least, that. The, the only way to perfectly secure private religious freedoms is to keep government entirely irreligious. Yes. <laughs> no favoritism, no acknowledgement, no preferential treatment, no taking sides, no declarations of monotheism or polytheism or anything, because it should be entirely in the private sphere. Mm -hmm. That's how you keep it um, entirely free and, and, out, uh, and not repressive. Well, good. I mean, that's great. You guys are out there not only sort of doing the stuff on YouTube, but challenging the violations in your own community because mm -hmm. it, it is, it does require you that kind of constant vigilance for everyone's freedoms to be protected. So thanks for being a freedom warrior. Oh, yeah. Social justice freedom warrior in real life. Yes. Yeah. So intimidating. <laughs> 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 Look at me with the power of my my righteousness and humanism and yeah, like my common sense. That's yeah. like <laughs> yeah. That's, so so that was I think that was the only other thing that I wanted to bring up. And I'm sure eventually someday I'll have more to talk about. But that's pretty much it. Well, hopefully you're talking about the sleep you get because if you've got two jobs <laughs> and a YouTube channel and you're doing you know trying to find ways to do more advocacy and political activism outside of your house. Uh, I can't imagine when you sleep. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sick right now, so. Oh, you poor thing. Yeah, it's okay. No, thank um, you. But. <laughs> and Germany, well wishes would be gute Besserung. It's like good bettering. I hope you, you know, have a good bettering of your health. So, oh, yeah. So you need not uh, coffee, but like lemon tea and honey. I know, but I needed the caffeine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Because it's so late at night for you, where it's... Yes, it is, it is almost 2 o'clock in the morning where I am at. So. Yes. Uh, yes, because we're only, we're five minutes away from an hour. So that yeah. seems like... That, a, that is perfect timing, so... You, absolutely. You an hour. So this here is Apollo. Uh, oh, yes, we didn't introduce Apollo. I haven't Apollo. introduced anybody to Apollo yet. This is Apollo. He is one of mine. He's been in quite a few of my videos, so... Yeah, He's been stealing the show the whole time, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Huh. Yeah, so, well, thank you, Christy, for talking to me tonight, today, yes, this was, morning. <laughs> yes, it was a lovely chat, and I hope we can do it again in the future, because it, it's, um, it's nice to give you the space to kind of tell your story, and, and then, you know, I know that you could, you talk in the chats or whatever, but, yeah, sometimes the it's just nice to have 
a little one casual. On one. Yeah, precisely. Oh, I feel like giving you a hug now. Oh, <laughs> All right, and goodbye, everybody. We're going off right now. <laughs>